me start by sharing uh, four different um, statements with you. One of them is that equality is better for everyone. That's the subtitle of a really famous book uh, called The Spirit Level. The second is the claim that CEO pay packages actively discourage innovation. The third is that the outperformance of ESG strategies is beyond doubt. ESG stands for environmental, social and governance. So this claims that ethical investing outperforms. And the final one is coronavirus may have infected half of the UK population. So all four statements have three things in common. So the first is they all claim to be backed up by evidence and research. The second is these are all statements that we would like to be true. We'd like to believe that equal societies perform better. We'd like to believe that ethical investing pays off. We'd like to believe that half the population has already had coronavirus because then we might be immune and we can end the lockdown. And we also would like to believe that CEO pay packages cause bad actions because many people think that CEO pay is crooked and corrupt and so people are inclined to believe it has these unintended consequences. But what is the third thing that these all have in common? It's that they are actually not backed up by the evidence as they claim. And that's actually linked to the second problem that we would like to believe them. That's why these statements have been accepted uncritically, even though the evidence is weak, because we would like them to be true. And so this is a phenomenon known as confirmation bias, the temptation to accept anything which confirms our prior belief and reject any study or piece of evidence if it contradicts us. And so that's the topic I talked about in a TED talk uh, two years ago called What to Trust in a Post-Truth World on Confirmation Bias. So there was a TED talk which was titled Want a More Innovative Company? Hire More Women. And that was something which was immediately believed why people would like to believe that gender diversity pays off. And I'm someone who, who strongly believes in the importance of diversity on many fields. And I certainly benefit from ethnic diversity initiatives. But if you look at the study, it doesn't actually show this at all. What it finds is that companies with um, more diversity do better. Now, one of the huge problems is causation v correlation. We're going to talk about that later. But also the measure of diversity, they actually had six measures of diversity. And only one of them was female diversity. And their results looked at the six in aggregate. So we don't know whether it was female diversity that was driving this or other forms of diversity. But because maybe this was the attractive thing to highlight, that was uh, highlighted in the title. Even though the evidence only showed a mere correlation, not a causation, and only for aggregate diversity. Let's think of another study. There's a report released last year saying CEO pay packages actively discourage innovation in the UK's top companies. Now, the problem with the uh, TED talk was there was a correlation but not causation. Here, there wasn't even a correlation. Right? Why? Because uh, what the study had done is it showed that CEOs were paid with bonuses and the authors just assumed that bonuses discouraged innovation. They didn't show it. They just assumed their result. And again, this is something that can be easily checked. So one of the things I'd like to stress uh, is that checking you know, the facts is not actually something which is that complex. Right here, what you could do is you could just easily look into the study of innovation uh, and diversity and find, well, there are six measures of diversity or just look um, quickly at what's the data source that the second study did to look at innovation. And there was no data source because they never studied the effect on innovation that you can do in a couple of minutes. OK, so I'm going to go to a uh, deeper into more serious and more subtle forms of confirmation bias. And this is something which I'm calling the narrative fallacy. So this is taken from a best selling book called Start With Why by C Simon Sinek. And that was something I was really predisposed to believing a lot of my work is on purpose. So I do believe that the why is important. But unfortunately, the evidence here is actually pretty weak. So Simon Sinek's most famous example is Apple. And he says that Apple has a why, which is everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. 
I've already talked about checking whether something is true. Let's assume that Apple did say this. Well, Simon Sinek's conclusion is that that why is what caused Apple to be successful. Apple had this mission statement and it became extremely successful because of that why. But the narrative fallacy is the idea that we weave in narratives and explanations, even if things were completely unrelated. So it may be that Apple's success was due to many, many other things than the why, but we weave in the narrative that the why caused it. Why? Because if we, ha if we have these cause and effect relationships, it helps us make sense of the world. Right. We like to think everything happens for a reason. That's what we tell our kids. And here, if we're trying to say, well, the why is what led to the success, then that sort of helps us understand why is Apple successful. And notice that it's a particularly attractive explanation. Now, there's other factors that could have led to Apple's success, but they're less attractive. If Apple was successful because Steve Jobs is really intelligent or because Steve Jobs had some great connections, that's disempowering to the average buyer of a book, because if you're not as intelligent as Steve Jobs, or if you don't have the great connections, you won't be successful. But a why being the driver of success, that's really empowering, because everybody believed, if I could just only find my why, then I'd be um, able to launch a successful company. And so that's why we like to, to weave in particularly attractive narratives when there could be multiple alternative explanations. And also, the explanation may only be valid ex post. So what I mean by this is after the fact, we force fit this explanation into um, the data that we see. Now, staying with Apple and staying with Steve Jobs, perhaps his most famous um, address talk was the 2005 graduation speech at um, Stanford University, where he said we'd like to connect the dots going forwards, but you can only connect the dots going backwards. And what he means by this is that if you see sort of the history of a company, you might have think, well, the company started with the why in order to be successful, and then it, it was able to attract some inspired people and it became successful. But in fact, that's not the case. It sort of muddles through and random things happen. And then in retrospect, you can claim that all of this delib was deliberate when it actually wasn't. Now, let me go one final level deeper into another case in which we've seen confirmation bias. And this is something which is new, and I haven't seen the term before, so I'm going to coin the term universality bias. So what do I mean by this? So all of the problems that I've spoken about so far in the first half hour of the talk are on what I'm calling internal validity. That is the arguments are internally inconsistent. So why, Apple's why may not have caused its success. There could have been many other factors. Similarly, it might not be inequality that, that caused obesity. There's other factors. So internally, that's inconsistent. Here, I'm going to talk about something different, which is external validity. So even if an argument was internally watertight, even if we could prove that Apple's why was the cause of its success and not sort of Steve Jobs' um, contacts or, or intelligence, there's still a problem because that they, this may not apply to other companies. So I call it universality bias because we try to over-extrapolate from a single story and assume that it applies everywhere. Like this is a problem with, with case studies. I'll point the finger at my own profession. Business schools like to teach from one case study and the insights from that they claim are generally applicable. Like TED Talks and books, they all start with a story and a claim that that's generalizable. But this is not the case because it may well be that what caused some companies to be successful is their why. Other companies, it could be their technology. Other companies, they could have um, engaged in monopoly power. Other companies just had a great idea. It's very rare that we have one explanation that explains everything. But universality bias says that we like to think of single explanations that apply everywhere. We would like a theory of everything. right? If there was one great diet, let's say the Atkins diet is a simple way to lose weight. Everybody can, um, can, can, can use that. We don't need to tailor our advice to particular people. 
And again, any best-selling book which says, my solution works for all of you, you're going to sell far more books than if you said, well, my solution only works for uh, those in their 30s who live in rural areas rather than urban areas. Okay, so, so far, you might think I've painted a, a quite bleak picture, which is that you can't trust nearly everything. So even best-selling books or even um, some powerful government documents. But I am actually not exaggerating with this. So I don't think I'm painting a bleak picture. I think I'm painting an accurate picture. Is that many things you actually cannot fully trust. Why books become best-selling is that they confirm what people would like to be true, even if it's not backed up by evidence. And also they claim universality. Why is a book which claims that they're applicable to everybody is going to be bought more than a book which says, oh, my solutions, the evidence was only studying people in their mid-30s in rural environments. So the next part is going to be the upside, the silver lining, practical tips to try to find out, well, how can we address this problem of confirmation? So the first is, um, is a statement backed up by a reference? So Bernie Sanders' statement clearly wasn't. And notice here, all of these practical tips are very simple. You don't need to be an academic insider or an expert to apply them. It might not sh show what the quota claims it shows. If the quote, if, if the evidence is by the people who are actually making the quote, check whether they do that. For the diversity study, they use six measures rather than just looking at gender diversity. Are there plausible alternative explanations? We can also look, is it published in a top peer-reviewed journal? So why is this important? So there's so much research out there, and this research hugely varies in terms of quality. And indeed, the anti-vaccination movement was backed up by some supposed research. So what matters isn't just that there's research showing it, but that that research has been published in a top peer-reviewed journal. And none of the four statements that they, I started this talk with were backed up by peer-reviewed research. So why is peer review so important? Well, what it involves is it involves a paper being sent to some of the world's experts on this topic who anonymously scrutinise it. They look at the methodology to see, well, does the evidence actually support the claims that authors are making? Now, you might think, well, it's impractical to check every source. Well, even though I've tried to stress that these things are actually not that cumbersome to check, still we have limited time. So what are the ones that we want to be particularly careful about? And if we could only check sort of 20% of articles, which are the 20%? So those are ones that are particularly one-sided, which have claims of clear evidence or universality. And also, it's not only just the sources themselves, which are one-sided that we want to check, but anything that sort of we are most likely to latch onto, we want to check the other side because we ourselves might be suffering from confirmation bias. The other thing that we could do is we can encourage externally dissent from others. So how can we do this? Well, first in a meeting, allow juniors to speak first. Because if a senior speaks first, then the juniors might be afraid to say anything which contradicts them. The second is the idea of a golden silence. So many meetings, they send out the memo, the meeting agenda in advance. Now, the problem with that is then people start discussing the agenda with their colleagues. And if a boss has said her views on this, then maybe other people will sort of then start to think about the boss's view. And then if you're, even if your view is different from the boss's, then you're not going to be raising it in the meeting. So in Amazon, what they do is they don't send out the memo in advance. The first half hour of the meeting is the golden silence where they're given the memo and everybody reads it. And so when the discussion starts, Nobody has had a preconceived view because the boss hasn't been able to share her thinking on the memo with other people. They're not skewed by it. The juniors speak first and you get a diversity of viewpoints. Sometimes if you're asking for approval, prohibit replies all which are saying, I agree. So I sit and serve on some boards where sometimes we're asked to approve the appointment of somebody for this position. And then the first person who replies all says, I agree. Great appointment then other people will then start replying all and saying they agree. And if anybody is sort of a, a disagreeing with this, they're afraid to say so because everybody has started this cascade of agreeing. 
So instead, just have the replies being in silence, and sorry, being anonymous, being um, offline to the particular chair of the committee. And then if indeed they're saying their concerns and those concerns are things that should be discussed, then you can share that. But again, you encourage dissent by having your votes go privately rather than on a reply order. I put conclusion at the top of a memo. So I serve on an external investment advisory committee where our job is to prove whether a stock should be invested in or not. And often at the top of the memo, they will say, are oh, we overall rated this as an invest? And they give all of the reasons and they ask us to approve this or not. And in many cases, you, you like that. Right? They say that a great newspaper article should be the opposite of a mystery novel. You don't want the punchline to be at the end. You want it to be at the start. But here, the problem is, is that, well, if indeed they've said we overall think we should invest in the company, even if they were sort of borderline and on the fence, then I'm going to be reading the rest of the article thinking, how can I justify this invest recommendation? I've already had in my mind this anchor that this is something where the people would like to invest in. And I'm just being asked to sign off on it and rubber stamp it. So I'm going to overweight anything positive and underweight anything negative. And it's the same with equity research reports. So those of you who are investors, you'll know that a broker note from Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs will say at the start, buy, strong buy or something. But even if the report is a little bit nuanced, you might ignore anything which is contradictory. Why? Because the headline has been in your mind and it's fixated something. And so you ignore anything which is contradictory. Finally, don't have discussions on reappointment of people when they're in the room even if it seems a formality. So again, I've served on boards where we are asking, do we want to reappoint Sarah as a director? And people might say, oh, let's just pretend Sarah is in the room. Who opposes this? Now, clearly nobody's going to oppose this because Sarah is in the room. And they, they might think, well, it's clear that Sarah has been a great director. There's no need to go through the formality of having her leave the room and then vote. Well, it might well be the case that Sarah was of a no-brainer. But we don't want to get into the habit of doing this because the next time we do have a case and it's not clear-cut, if the habit is that we allow the person to be in the room, then we're not going to have any dissenting viewpoints. And what if you're the person being discussed? Remove yourself. So I am the managing editor of one of the top 50 journals on the list previously. And at a recent meeting last year, my reappointment as editor was being discussed and uh, this is an agenda item. And they said, oh, the next agenda item is um, Alex's reappointment. Oh, you're doing a great job. We, 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 uh, we don't, you don't need to leave the room. We'll just approve this. And I said, absolutely not. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to leave the room. And they said, no, Alex, don't. Look, that's just a waste of time. And I said, no, I, you're not going to stop me. I'm walking out of the room. So that they could have a discussion about me. Because if there was something negative, then it should have been discussed and by me being there, um, that would not have allowed this. So I think that's just important, even if you think a decision is a no-brainer, to give the people the chance to express negative views.